Welcome back again um, to our series on the Building Blocks Framework. We are at session three um, with one more session to go next week. And today we will be focusing on embedded learning opportunities. So I think you probably know this by now, but I'm Carrie Kennegeiser. I'm the program director for Skippy and I have with me here. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate Aceta. Welcome back. Uh, and hello, if this is your first time, glad to have you. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. And for folks who are not able to be with us live, this is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel afterwards. So here's where we are in our schedule. Last week, we talked about curriculum modifications um, and adaptations, which is the second block in the building block framework. And so we really dove into thinking about changes to our ongoing classroom activity or materials that facilitate or maximize kiddos participation in our planned activities and routines. Today, we will be describing the benefits of using embedded learning opportunities. We'll explain the steps to use embedded learning opportunities. We'll describe the elements of an instructional interaction, which is part of an ELO, which is an easier way to say embedded learning opportunity. It's kind of a mouthful. And then we will take a stab at writing and using an ELO instructional plan, also known as an ELO at a glance. Do we have any questions about what we're doing today? Okay, great. Um, and also as a reminder, I think you already know this, but feel free to use the chat throughout the session to ask any questions or just provide feedback, comments, interact, um, engage with the content that we're sharing. And we will have opportunities throughout the session to engage a bit more and then definitely time at the end for some questions. As a reminder, right, we've discussed that Building Blocks is a framework that is intended to help teachers and others in the early in early learning programs provide effective education to young children and really to make good decisions about the level of support that an individual child might need in order to participate and learn. So we talked about this in session one and we touched on it last week. When we're getting started with the building blocks framework, we always wanna assess the quality of our classrooms. We wanna plan that classroom schedule, right? What are we doing? It's just good practice in early childhood. Then we're thinking about how we can plan for individual children. And a lot of that is thinking about our activity matrix. So looking at our schedule, looking at all of our routines and activities that we have and where things kind of naturally fit to meet children's needs. Um, and then we're always going to make sure that we're evaluating, we're checking progress, we're clarifying and thinking about, is this working? If not, what do I need to tweak? So that's our, right, that's kind of the, the foundation and thinking about what we need to do. And as we sort of move up the block tower, um, that's a way of representing how the teacher and the team can sort of increase the intensity and the specificity of the support given to an individual child. So despite having a quality environment, and even with really great modifications and adaptations, some kiddos will need more support and more specific instruction in order to achieve the objectives that have been set for them. So intensity and specificity of support is determined for each learning objective. And a single kiddo might need these embedded learning opportunities for some objectives. They might need curriculum modifications to achieve others, and they might need more specialized instruction, which we'll talk about next week, child-focused instructional strategies for others. And for some learning objectives, they might not need any special instruction at all um, because that high quality, supportive uh, early childhood environment will be sufficient. So today we're gonna focus on embedded learning opportunities as we kind of go up this um, block tower. And with that, I'll pass it to Kate to tell you more. Sure, so what are embedded learning opportunities? Well, as it says right here, uh, they are short or 
um, usually short as in the sense of like, they're not many pages, a couple lines. And we're gonna get to the, the ELO at a glance, which is like the sort of form or template that one might use while, uh, while putting these together. It is an instructional interaction that's embedded into the ongoing daily classroom routines or transitions or activities. They are uh, instructional interactions focused on the child's individual learning goals. So whatever that might be. Again, you'll hear that we're not saying specifically IEP goals because it really is about individual child learning objectives. So you don't need to have an IEP or an IFSP in order for uh, an, an embedded learning opportunity to be a really sound and strong instructional strategy to use. Um, there's a couple other names where you might say, I don't know if I've ever heard of an ELO, but you may have heard of its friends, also known as embedded instruction, embedded teaching, activity-based intervent, uh, intervention, ABI, naturalistic instruction, and incidental teaching. So lots of names to all say the exact same thing, which is a short planned interaction that provide opportunities to focus on specific learning objectives and that it occurs during ongoing activities, routines, and transitions. This is a critical point. Um, you are not creating something new. You are not designing a specific uh, lesson plan or activity specifically directed around this one goal or learning objective. Rather, you are embedding it into your daily routine. So that really is purposeful instruction, you're planning and you're thinking about when and how you're going to target that specific skill. I'm going to make sure I'm not missing anything. And it's, oh, the match between the goal and the activity. So if you know that there's some fine motors, it's a fine motor goal or it's a language goal, you're going to think about when during your daily routine would that happen. So let's take a look at what the sort of steps are. Or Carrie, did I miss anything there that you want to... No, I, I think you got it. And I'm sure you probably said that a huge part of this is planning, right? We know that this, there's lots of things that are teachable moments. This is not a teachable moment. We are being no. super intentional by planning in advance and really thinking about how we might set up the environment to elicit these types of interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where um, the steps will come in that Kate will talk about, and that's where that ELO at a glance form helps us to be purposeful and, and plan ahead for these situations. Yeah, because like, here's the thing. If you haven't guessed, I'm a real on the fly teachable moment kind of teacher. However, that did not mean that I did not have a really clear plan about when I was going to be targeting individual children's goals and learning objectives throughout the day. AKA I wrote it down and we're going to see some examples of how not fancy this needs to be because if it's too hard and too complicated, we're never going to do it. And if you're not going to do it, then it can't lead to improved outcomes for young children that we work with. So we want to make sure that it feels doable and manageable. Um, and so we'll bring some, some brainstorm, some ideas uh, shortly. All right, let's click on. So Look at that, four simple steps. Not sorry, I have multiple screens open at one time. I always do. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Got four simple steps. Step one, you're going to clarify the kid's learning objective. What specific are you working on? Is it going to be, um, you know, really thinking about like, what's the function of the goal or the objective? Um, is it about stacking blocks? Is it about the actual fine motor of that pincer grass and being able to pick something up? What's the goal or the purpose of the specific learning objective? Um, is it about visual spatial knowledge or is the purpose to actually stack blocks one on top of one another? Why does that matter? Because we're going to be mindful and planful and really thinking about when we're going to utilize this specific instructional opportunity. And that's really, I think, a good way to think about their instructional opportunities we are being planful and purposeful in utilizing them. There's opportunities abound to teach kids great things, but we miss them all throughout the day simply because we haven't planned. Um, <clears throat> step two, uh, we're going to think about, we're going to identify or create embedded learning opportunities. So you're going to think about the goal. 
I mean, it's a really simple goal that I think like a ton of kids are working on all the time, requesting help. So the goal is the is to request help. We're going to clarify what that means. We're going to say for Garrett, it's going to be requesting help from an adult. So, and we'll say even more so it's a, for Garrett, it's going to be a verbal request. He currently has a little picture card that he's also using, but we're going to really want to focus on Garrett starting to vocalize, I need help or I want help. Or even help, please. Although honestly, let's focus on the the nicety words and manners later on. Let's focus on words that are going to give us um, uh, get our needs met first, um, and then we can work on nicety words. Please and thank you can come later. Um, <clears throat> let's focus on words that uh, empower and decrease challenging behavior. So that's just a little side note from my own personal and professional opinions there. So we've identified we're going to focus on uh, Garrett using a verbal expression of "I want help" or "I need help." or we would even accept help please, any of those three variations. Garrett's getting exposed to a variety of generalized of that phrasing so that he um, doesn't become too scripted in his language. We wanna be pretty consistent. So we're gonna think, when are times during the day, and feel free to drop some of these in the chat. When are some times during the day that we could really work on this with Garrett? Requesting help. hanging up his backpack at arrival. Um, I know that Garrett is gets frustrated when he's trying to zip up his zipper. I'm gonna think about arrival procedures. Um, I might set up an opera lunch to open containers. Excellent snack. Oh, meals, 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 meals. Great opportunity. And that is where we can really think about the instructional strategies piece of how we might set up the learning environment just a little bit in order to facilitate the opportunity for that, to do some of that beautiful incidental teaching um, where we sort of do a manned model approach of really thinking about how to elicit that. Beautiful bathroom dressing, any of those like adaptive type of skills, beautiful, beautiful independent self-help skills, perfect. So we're gonna think, and where is this information gonna come from? Look at your daily routine, look at your schedule, you're gonna take a look. Then we're gonna design and implement the instruction. This is not a complicated 20 page thing. We're gonna come up with all these new fancy materials. You know why? Because you're never gonna do it if it's too complicated. Also, this, this specific learning objective can and should be addressed during a daily routine activity. So it doesn't warrant a specific separate instructional time, which a child focused instructional uh, activities. We're gonna talk about those next week in week four. Um, however, for this particular one, it's going to be embedded into the daily routine. So it's going to happen really naturally. So we're really going to think about that. We're going to talk about what the instruction looks like in a little bit. Carrie's going to go through some instructional strategies about how to teach and elicit this kind of behavior that we're looking for. For Garrett, in this case, it's to request or ask for help. Absolutely. And then we got to monitor that child progress. We want to see, is it working? And that means we're going to have to get into my favorite four letter word data so collect a little bit of data think about ways that we can try and elicit this behavior and see is it working and that is not only just i'll say this also not as not just is it working for garrett but are we doing what we said we were going to do sometimes we only collect data on the kid and that is important but are we also doing the thing we said we were going to do so we can make sure that we're being consistent that if garrett requires uh, a verbal and a visual prompt, are we doing that consistently each time? And we're still not seeing the progress we were hoping to see? Or have we completely forgotten and we're just using a verbal prompt and it's too distracting at arrival time so Garrett's missing it and he would really use a I need help visual that we could hand to him and show him that he can request to give him that additional prompt. Um, and when we get into the sort of instruction and all these pieces, when we get to the next in two or three slides, when we get to the ELO at a glance, you'll, they'll really walk you through in details exactly what you would want to include in as you're thinking about these. Carrie, anything else? Nope, that sounds great. I think that's a really important piece to think about when you're kind of 
monitoring and collecting data to turn that mirror back on ourselves because so sometimes we're like, oh man, this is not working. He's just not getting it. But then are we, where's the fidelity of our implementation with this? Did we share this information with Miss Susie, who's also in the classroom and is supporting this kiddo? Um, does she know to do this consistently? Is she, are we supporting her in doing that? So that's a huge piece um, of making sure um, that we're doing what we said we were gonna do. Mm -hmm. Thanks that's for right. Me up. Yeah, if we're gonna, if we're gonna expect them to show up and do the work, we gotta do the work too. And we can forget that sometimes. Can, there's lots of things going on in our in our minds in our classrooms, so that can be hard. Let's think back. I think I believe we talked about the activity matrix in week one. Yeah, great. So let's just do a little refresher. We have just two really great examples here um, of where you might have a specific child. This is up in the top corner here. Um, I guess like on you. I don't know, like your right hand. It's, it's everybody's right hand side, I guess, except for maybe <laughs> Carrie's. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I'm spatial. <laughs> spatial dimensions are not my forte, but that's okay. I don't normally. I'm okay with driving and everything for that, for the most part. So, if you're taking a look at this one, we have um, down one column. We've got the daily schedule, right, for both of those. Then across the top, for one of the examples, you see the little arrow up there. We've got Anna, Kiana, and Xander. And then for the other ones, we have Hanny. Is that how you would pronounce um, yeah. that child's name? Okay, great. And we've got Hanny's three, four different goals here. Um, and this is just simply thinking about for Hanny in particular, when throughout the day would be bringing the spoon to the mouth to eat? When would we be doing that? You're probably not going to do that at nap time. Like I'm giggling, but like this is a natural, like what naturally, when would you do that? You're probably going to do this during meal times. Luckily, small children eat every two hours. So this is pretty easy to practice for a lot of kids. Um, <clears throat> Uh, say three to five words approximately. This is probably one of my like least favorite uh, objectives. <laughs> Sorry, I'm feeling very giggly today, but it's just one of my least favorite objectives. I read that, would read that a lot in IEPs and three to fives is really varied um, uh, and approximately. Anyway, so we will focus on those different types of things and think about when. You can work on saying words all throughout the day. We really want to encourage that. That is an easy one to really focus on. Putting items in small containers, absolutely. You can think about when you would do this naturally. Um, taking two to three steps, beautiful. So Hani can spend lots of opportunities to practice these different types of skills. When we look at the other um, activity matrix, that might be a little bit more of what your classroom would look like if you have multiple children that are working on different learning objectives. Um, and you see Anna, we've got Anna's down in one column, uh, Kiana, and then Xander's goals, and sort of when they would sort of be embedded into the daily routine. And I think this is a great one to take a look at. If you see it arrival up at the top, we've got, Anna's going to be working on removing that coat, so gross motor activity and fine motor as well, depending on the zipper. I'm assuming it's just simply the taking off of the coat there. And Kiana, we have respond to a greeting three times. You can do both of these things very easily into your daily routine um, and something that can happen really naturally. I think that sometimes we can feel overwhelmed at trying to address specific learning objectives for different kids during the same activity. And we can when we plan. We can't if we don't plan. That's just never going to happen. It's too hard if we're trying to be spontaneous and on the fly. That's great for a lot of things, but for really focused on learning objectives, we really want to make sure that we're going to embed these purposefully and planfully throughout the day. But as you can see, this really gives um, all of these kids lots of opportunities to be able to embed throughout the day um, and really gives them multiple opportunities to be able to practice these different skills. Or anything else? I don't want to rush. Any questions or anything? I don't see any in the chat, but I just wanted to make sure I haven't missed anything. About you might this. have said this, Kate, but I think so it helps the teacher to be organized, but then it's also supports that consistency. So any adult that's going to be in the classroom can say, oh, here's the activity matrix. I know what I'm going to do to support Anna, Kiana, and Xander. Um, or I know this is Hani's 
um, matrix that I'm going to use to support. So this way, mm -hmm. it's a tool that we can share to really mm -hmm. make sure that all of our learning opportunities are clear to anybody supporting the kiddos in our yeah. class. Yeah, and like an extension beyond this, we even had um, in my when I was a classroom teacher, we would have a clipboard at adult eye level with a, a you know, for privacy's sake, uh, like a little piece of construction paper over it um, in each area of the room. So you could simply lift it up and then see the activity with all of the child's goal, all children's goals that might be in there. Yeah, exactly. More than one, more than one spot in the room. Um, it would be really nice. And we got in the habit of reminding ourselves that if you went over to the block area during during center time, or if you were at small groups or we were at meal tables, the first thing you should do is the grown up is just lift up this sheet, take a look at who's at your table, refresh your memory of what specific learning objectives you're going to aim for for those kids during that time as just like a way uh, for a reminder. And sometimes we'd even throw some sticky notes up there of some data collection as well. Um, if we noted that there was, you know, that be behavior occurred during that time period. I'm just, Judy, I think you've been trying to raise your hand. Are you able to use the chat box or was the hand raised um, unintentional? <laughs> So I want to make sure if there was a question that you had that we can definitely um, give you the opportunity to ask that. Well, I'm allowing you to talk, Judy. Let's see. Maybe it was unintentional. <laughs> Okay. Oh, she put it in the chat. All right. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us. I just want to make sure we're no giving problem. Yeah. the opportunity to participate. Next Wonderful. slide. Uh, yeah, please. Let's, okay. <laughs> I want to give us a lot of time for practice and to talk about some potential uh, thumps and bumps along the way. Okay. <clears throat> so when we take a look at this, we want to think about what to teach. So there's sort of three pieces of the, um, the ELOs that we want to consider here, the what to teach. These are high priority individual learning objectives. And, um, and this specifically is really like, this is going to be language, fine motor, gross motor, some like really high leverage. This will increase engagement. This will increase independence. This will increase inclusionary opportunities. So we really want to focus on those types of learning objectives. I'm, I'm not saying you can't do, and there's no special book that says you can't do shapes and numbers. Sure, that is important. We want to make sure we're getting to those high leverage, high priority learning objectives so that we can increase engagement, increase inclusion, and increase their um, opportunities for independence and success uh, within the classroom opportunities. So really focusing on those, um, right? When do we teach it? During activities, routines, and transitions. Just like we've been saying, this is really just the daily activities. So again, you're looking throughout your day and you're saying, when can we focus on these specific learning objectives that are gonna increase the likelihood that a child is going to feel more included, engaged, and supported, and independent? So we wanna make sure all those things are happening. And when can we do it? During activities, routines, and transitions. Transitions are a great opportunity to really focus on those high priority individual learning objectives. Why? That's when kids tend to get lost. They can feel confused. And transitions are unfortunately sometimes a dead zone in instructional time, when in fact they are a great opportunity to really build in that intentional instructional opportunities um, and to think about that. And how do we do that? By being mindful and planful in our work. All right. And how, how are we gonna do this? We gotta think about how to teach it. We wanna complete teaching loops. That means we're going to we're going to prompt, we're going to do something to elicit. The behavior is either going to occur or not occur. And then we're going to follow up with some sort of feedback to maintain that. I don't want to give away too much because Carrie's going to talk about some other things in a few moments, but we really want to make sure that we're coming all the way back around, that it's not simply, as I like to say to my undergrads, we're not just asking questions. 
and waiting for a response. We need to be able to follow up with something. Um, and that'll make more sense in a few minutes, I think, when we get to the ELO at a glance and we sort of walk through the different steps in there. Carrie, is anything I'm missing here? No, I think that's any, perfect. Any enhancements? Okay, beautiful. <laughs> All right. So we have Samisha and this is, these are, let's take a look at some pieces. So right here on the screen, you can see this is the ELO to glance. This is coming right out of the text. Uh, this is nothing we made. This is some really fabulous work um, that other folks have put in here. And so we're gonna take a look at this specifically. So, oh, there it is, building blocks. Gotta love it, second and third edition, love them all. Um, we wanna make sure that the routines and the objectives are they clear? So the routine, when is this going to happen? Uh, free choice during tabletop game center. So even more specific, not just any old time during free choice, but a specific activity. Okay. So I'm thinking about that's where I'm going to be during that time. The objective is during play times, uh, Samisha will join her peers in play and maintain with them for 10 or more minutes in cooperative play activities. She will show this for four different play areas. Is it measurable? Is it observable? Yeah, checks that off for me. I know when it's gonna happen, where it's gonna happen, how long it's supposed to happen for and with whom. Not all of them are with whom, but this one definitely is. So we have, we have a sense it's gonna be with peers. Great. And it's gonna happen during four different play areas. Okay, great. So we're gonna think about that. 10 or more minutes, beautiful. So, we now think, and we're thinking, okay, that's great. This is what sort of happened naturally. So I'm going to, I'm going to think about this. So we want to think about what your role is, which is what are you going to do? Because we, this could be the goal. And then we're like, okay, we got that goal, but then we do business as usual. That's probably not going to lead to improved outcomes and Samisha reading, reaching her goal of being able to engage and maintain play, cooperative play with peers. We need to change our own behavior. So we're going to do something different than we did the day before, which is going to be focused on these two specific things, what we do and what we say and how we respond. So what are we going to do? We're going to point to or hand um, her the game prompt. So it might be a bar car, the ball, whatever the sort of materials are in the classroom. That's what I'm going to do as the adult. What am I going to say? Samisha, take a turn or some other sort of like developmentally appropriate prompt that we know that she would understand. So again, why are you writing this down? Because we want to be mindful and planful about what we're doing. We want to be purposeful with our prompts, purposeful with our language. Why? Because we want to elicit a specific behavior. We don't just want to elicit it, we want to teach it. So one of the ways that we're going to be able to teach it is by making sure we're thinking about what we're going to do. So we're going to point our hand, that's our verbal, our uh, nonverbal prompt. Um, then we're going to, what we're going to say, and then how you respond. Now there's two things in here. I don't know if you can read that in there, but we always want to think, what are we going to do if she does it? She follows the instruction and she begins playing. Yay! We want to acknowledge that. What if she doesn't? We prompt her, here, Samisha, take a turn. And she sort of looks at you, she walks away, she drops the prompt, whatever it happens to the prop, I keep saying prompt, the prop. And um, we want to make sure that we're going to have a backup that's going to lead to the learning of the behavior. So we want to reinforce, we want to support um, by providing feedback that's going to teach that behavior. So here they say, make sure that you're going to repeat the instruction. So, and you might even like hand over hand, you might encourage a little bit more, you might find something else that's going to keep her going a little bit more. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about ways that if the behavior does occur, so she does start to play, I would also say this is 10 minutes, I don't know what her actual like skills are, is she at eight, is she at five, that'll depend on the frequency with which you're going to prompt and provide reinforcement here to, in order to maintain that skill over a period of time. Um, the materials you need, you're going to pick table games that are used for two or more children at the same time. Uh, like Don't Break the Ice, one of my fam favorites, Hungry Hungry Hippos, and uh, or Hi-Ho Cheerio. 
which is a funny little game, but a game that lots of children like. And then you're going to think about when are you going to do the data collection? That's down here, the Monday through Friday. Choice time during table games for 10 plus minutes. So the when and for the how long. And you can simply, you could have a yes, no here. You could circle it. Um, I like adding a little data collection piece underneath here, splitting this little table in half. So you can put a yes, no, or a little smiley face or whatever, or like a little spot for a note. So you could simply have something that says like, oh, six minutes today, you know, that kind of a thing, or didn't like the game. I don't know. Maybe she doesn't like hungry, hungry hippos. So keep note of those kinds of things, which will help you um, increase uh, the likelihood that we'll see opportunities for that. And again, planning, 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 knowing what kids like, knowing what they're interested in, using those as ways to increase the likelihood that we're going to be able to um, get this get this going. Awesome. Any? Thanks, Kate. No, good. Okay. I don't see anything in the chat, and that's great. So okay. that will lead us along to our instructional interactions or loops or whatever we want to call them. Um, but again, this instruction takes place within the context of an interaction that we're having um, with the kiddo. So an instructional interaction has three parts and sometimes we call them slightly different things. Um, in building blocks, they call the first part the antecedent, right? Because it's what's coming before. So that's some sort of cue to elicit that target behavior. Then we have the actual behavior, the target that we're hoping for. So we, we need to observe that child's response. And then we have the consequence. What do we do after the behavior, happens or it doesn't happen. Um, and so again, we're going to provide some type of feedback um, depending on what the child does or doesn't do. So building blocks refers to these ABCs as an instructional interaction. And again, there are other terms for this such as complete learning trial, teaching loop, teaching episode or discrete trial. So you've probably heard of this in some form. So I think I've already talked through a lot of my notes. Let me just double check. So when we're here, when we're at the antecedent, when, when we're providing a cue, we are planning what we're going to do or say, like Kate mentioned, um, or we can arrange the environment in particular ways to help us elicit that target behavior. Then we're watching for the behavior. And then we're going to provide some feedback, um, which if the child doesn't do what we are hoping and plan for them to do, then we're gonna have that corrective feedback. And then if they do do what we're hoping, we're still going to have some feedback that kind of affirms, great job, you did X. And we wanna be real specific with that, um, which I am going to show you some examples in a moment. Kate, anything else? Uh, no, just how important that behavior specific uh praise or feedback is so that kids can make that connection and that we're real quick to come in with that gentle correction or redirection um when the a, a desired behavior is not expressed that's where the learning takes place if <laughs> if if the kid is supposed to if the aim is that they're supposed to request help verbally and they don't that's okay the issue is when they their response is to throw their body on the ground and have a tantrum and then we zip up the coat anyway. I'm looking at you folks <laughs> that's that's the adult that's we got to make sure that we're we're going to change our behavior, our response, our consequence. Um, and what we're going to do in that and take ownership of that so we can make sure that we can support the kinds of behaviors that we're hoping to be able to see and that the, the sort of target skill there. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's look at an example here. So maybe the antecedent or the cue is the teacher shows a picture of an animal and asks, what's this? The target, what we are observing, we will, in this case, the child says the correct name of the animal. So then our consequence or our feedback is, that's right, it's a pig. And then maybe we give the child that picture card. Boom, there is our learning trial, there is our loop, 
there's whatever we want to call it, our instructional interaction. Check, done. But what happens if the child doesn't get it correct? So let's start again. What's this? The kiddo says dog. This is a pig. Say pig. So we're then, that's where the learning is taking place. We're not just saying, nope. <laughs> we're, we're helping them by providing exactly what it is and prompting them. In this case, we're using a verbal prompt and telling them, say pig, so that they're going to have that piece of interaction. Can I add a little piece to that? Absolutely. That I think is so critical and a really common um, error at, uh, and pattern that we find ourselves in. Child says the incorrect animal. We ask the question again. <laughs> ta, 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 ta. That does not teach the child the correct response. If they knew that it was a pig, they probably would have said pig if they could have. So we want to assume that the, that the child, if they knew the correct answer, they were going to, they were going to elicit the correct thing. Asking the same question again doesn't teach. It's just repetition of the question. So we want to make sure that we are, that the, that the consequence, the maintaining the piece that happens at the end, the feedback that they get is always about the correct response. That's how we really can sort of change that child behavior. And I know that some of you may be bristling out there at the idea of sort of providing corrective feedback. We want to remember that for this specific child and for these specific um, learning objectives we're talking about is they're not occurring naturally throughout the day through regular exposure. So they've now been highlighted as mm, this isn't happening during natural child led child directed activities, we need to provide some more direct instruction in order to provide these learning opportunities, because it's just not, a, it's not naturally happening. So we want to make sure that we're going to provide this extra structure so that we can really support them in learning these different um, um, goals or behaviors. Right, right. That's why we're, we're at the third step of the building block. So we know we're doing mm -hmm. something to provide more support for these children, for this particular objective that they're working on. So let's look at another example. All right, let's see what the antecedent is. The teacher places blue, green, and yellow bears and three trays in front of a kiddo. And while pointing to each tray, the teacher says, sort the bears, put the blue bears here, put the green bear bears here, and put the yellow bears here. So the target behavior and what we want to see, and in this case, the kiddo does it, they sort the bears correctly, the blue go here, the yellow go here, the green goes here. So our feedback or the consequence of that interaction, maybe we nod, maybe we swat, smile, um, maybe we do, we nod and we say, great job putting the blue bears here and the yellow bears here and the green bears here. So we're reinforcing exactly what they did. So I would do even more than just nod. Right. Mm -hmm. What happens if they don't do that? Same antecedent, but the kiddo just is not sorting the bears. So our consequence or our constructive feedback, let me help. I repeat those instructions and then I use hand over hand assistance or a gestural prompt. Oh, sorry. That's the pointing was the gestural prompt, but the hand over hand assistance for the corrective feedback to really say, oh, the blue bears go here, the green bears go here. So I'm providing that support to help them get to where we want them to be. Anything to add, Kate? Uh, no, no, I just, I'm loving these. All right. I think it's really nice to have the, like, so we've had, we've, the, the behavior has occurred. Woo the behavior has not still it's okay this is what learning it's more likely that this is going to happen this is the more likely scenario in the first couple of exposures and opportunities is that it's not going to happen right away so this is why we plan for it so that we can be ready for how to teach it this is where the teaching happens the teaching happens in this moment and that's when the learning happens right so now we'll take a minute and we'll look at a video, but I see something in the chat. 
What about oh, yes. it to two discriminators as part of the instructional process if they can't sort three? Yeah, that's great, Lisa, because maybe three was too much for them, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe this was, I realized, hmm, let me break it down, right? Let me go back to that objective and try again and see if they can then, oh, the yellows go here and the blues go here. And then we move on from there. So I have two video clips and they're both from the Head Start Center for Inclusion and they show some examples of using ELOs. So in this example, there is, um, the child's objective is to use a spoon to scoop and eat. So I want you to kind of look at this. It's a quick one um, and notice what the teacher is doing and then um, just share out what you noticed, questions you might have. Is that spoon going? Yeah. One more. How are you ready to eat? What did you notice the teacher doing that you liked or that felt right in the process of using an embedded learning opportunity? And you can use the chat. And then on the flip side, what were some questions or wonderings you had or things that you thought the teacher could have done differently that would have better supported this child's um, learning of the particular um, objective of using the spoon to scoop and eat. So I'm seeing a, a lot in the chat, right? She used some prompts, she used some hand over hand assistance, physical prompts to encourage that motion of using the spoon. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm seeing all that in the chat. What do you think about the time of day or the activity or routine that the teacher chose to embed this objective? Yeah, Zandra, I agree. She was not very vocal, that teacher. So I would have liked to hear more about, you know, what the child was doing, um, whether, the, you know, what the teacher was doing, I'm helping you, this is what we do to make the spoon go up, or, you did a great job of holding the spoon and lifting it to your mouth. There, I didn't hear a lot of words, but maybe I was distracted by the background noise. It could have just been me. No, I couldn't, I couldn't hear it either. And great catch Dana on, um, he actually does, he starts to grasp the spoon and brings it up to his mouth. Um, and so providing a, a, and changing uh, the specific reinforcement because he does, he does really, or I shouldn't say he, I don't know the gender of the child. The child um, uses the spoon um, and, and really, um, they're really trying very hard to, to do a nice scoop motion there. I do wish that they had a slightly different bowl um, for our small friend, because um, I do think it might've helped a little bit with some of the, the scooping and keeping a little bit more this year and feel a little more successful there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, Lisa, I thought that too. It kind of did disrupt the interaction to clean the face. We can wait to clean the face when the whole, you know, when the meal is over, right? <laughs> and then obviously, if my goal is to use a spoon to scoop and eat, well, then mealtimes are a great time to embed that. It's a great fit. It's natural. It's logical. It just makes sense. What might we have done differently if the child's objective, instead of 
um, to use the spoon to eat, what if the objective was to use a variety of simple tools or utensils with greater control? Then how might our possibilities for this learning opportunity expand? If, it, if I'm not specifically talking about scooping and eating, if I just said use a variety of tools with greater control or even use a variety of tools to scoop, when might I embed this activity outside of mealtime? Yeah, Lisa, some fine motor tasks. When else during the day might I be scooping something? Yeah, Dana, I was thinking that too, the sensory table, yeah. sandbox, yes, yeah, Sherry. Yeah. Exactly, Allison, beautiful. And that might be a better goal because then it's gonna provide more opportunities for practice, which is mm -hmm. so key when I'm using embedded learning opportunities or ELOs. I wanna give kiddos so many opportunities to practice that skill because you all know that more opportunities to practice means more opportunities to learn the skill and then generalize it across other areas. Mm -hmm. well we don't we don't know lucy they might they might have some real farm animals uh local who knows where you could <laughs> you could provide opportunities to uh to to feed those animals <laughs> or even family style so being able to uh, this this program may not have the opportunity where they do family style serving of being able to scoop materials scoop food onto their own plate and self-serve um, but that's another opportunity to be able to provide those kinds of things yeah thanks everybody i'm looking at the time and i think we're going to skip the second video so that we have some more time to actually look at um, completing an elo at a glance so there's the blank at a glance that Kate talked about, when, but she had the one with Samisha's example. So here's a practice goal and let's use this. And um, you can think about your own classrooms as the context and your own schedule of activities so we can work on this together. So let's look at this goal. In a variety of play situations, Maya will share or exchange objects with other children on at least 80% of the opportunities provided. So let's think, what is it that we want Maya to do? What's our objective for Maya? Yeah, right, if we're just breaking it down to something that's quick and simple, um, we want her to share and exchange objects not necessarily with adults, it's specific with other kids. So we're thinking about mm -hmm. that piece. So thinking about that, what are some natural routines and activities throughout your day where we might wanna embed this? What makes sense? Right, the playground. We might think about right. ways you could do this on the playground, Lucy. Centers, Centers. Absolutely. outside time, beautiful. Yeah, small group. Mm -hmm. Right, these are all natural fits. Yeah, playing board games. So again, during center time or free play. Yeah, that would work. So right, Janet, one way when we're getting to the what are we going to do, you're kind of a step ahead. So how are we going to kind of set this situation up? So like Janet said, we might limit the amount of materials around to kind of present that opportunity where oh, well, I only have so many, so we're going to have to share. Yes, Crystal, we might require, we might use a game that requires trading an object like a spinner. Yeah, that sort of playful obstruction or those kinds of things and, uh, and really thinking about, and that's again, thinking about what materials you might need. So that might be an opportunity to think about, well, I know it's gonna be a small group fine, fine motor activity. And so we're gonna focus on, 
we're going to have two bowls of glue instead of three and they'll have to take turns passing the glue to one another um yeah i would i would also think about again you know it's hard to know who knows what other skills maya is working on and what her other skills or classmates are working on but we would want to be making sure that we're not overtaxing what a one per, a particular child's what they're working on like if they're also working on cutting and fine motor we might also want to think about like maybe this isn't the time and while we're trying to teach frustration tolerance for a difficult fine motor task to also have to share so thinking about those kinds of things yeah yeah that's a great point kate <clears throat> but you would know that because you're going to be the teachers of the kids so you would know your kids and you'd be able to plan purposely for that to make sure that you're thinking about opportunities when this could really happen so then what might we say, say. and then how might might we respond if the child does what we're expecting if they're sharing or what might we say if the child doesn't share And I would even be more specific, Sandra. I would specifically say maybe if they shared the Play-Doh roller, then I would say, great job sharing the Play-Doh roller with Kate. I could tell she really wanted a turn. <laughs> and look, it made Kate so happy. Yeah, so give that prompt. So Lucy's giving an example of something you would say to prompt. Remember, if Maya is not consistently sharing or exchanging objects, the what you're going to say is going to be really important because you're likely going to need to give a verbal prompt to elicit that behavior. Um, so it, yes, it's the materials, but also making sure that like what's our role in eliciting that behavior. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way you're, yeah, really specific there. So Sherry, you got some trading action going. Mm -hmm. And remember, also think about, you don't know, who knows what, I don't know, I don't know Maya very well, but let's say I did. Also, we want to think about our language and how complex our language is going to be. And remembering that we're also running a class with 19 other kids. So we want to make sure that our responses also can be short and brief. And that is okay. Like, I think that like, and in general directions and prompts, we want to sort of keep them to the point. So I think giving yourself permission to be able to, to prompt and be really direct with that. You know, we want to make sure we're going to say something like, Maya, it's Garrett's turn to play with the, or Garrett's turn, and then, you know, a phys full physical prompt, sort of depending on the sort of where, where Maya is at this point, because we're sort of assuming Maya is just going to like, she knows what share is, and it's going <laughs> to just like hand that over, but she may not, so she might need more of a physical prompt, but you would know that because you'd be her teacher. Yeah, your turn, my turn. Yep. Good point, Lucy. And then we'll think about how many opportunities we're providing each day. So we're not, this is something that Maya needs to work on. She wasn't getting it in our classroom that's already high quality. She wasn't getting it with some modifications and adaptations. So we're not just going to provide one opportunity a day for Maya to practice this. We want to think about multiple opportunities in each day, thinking about, all right, well, like you said, this might this makes sense on the playground, this makes sense in centers. Where are those pieces that we can use on our matrix to provide Maya multiple opportunities to practice this skill of sharing objects with her peers? So I'm looking at the time again, We've got a couple more minutes. Sandra, did you know I was gonna pick Jack as the next name? It was like, you almost knew it. <laughs> so let's take two minutes to look at this other example. So when given an individual instruction and shown a picture schedule, Jack will follow the classroom routine for at least seven 
I should say, out of um, 10 of the typical daily transitions. So when are we going to embed this? We want him to follow that routine. We're giving him an instruction and he's got that picture schedule that we're showing. So it's, we, we're using that tool, that prompt for him. What are some routines, activities in the day that we would choose to embed this objective? Okay, arrival and dismissal. Right, maybe with our washing our hands, backpack. Right, there's a lot of routines that you have across the day. Yeah, Crystal said all day, right? <laughs> and we might start about focusing on some specific routines that we know Jack struggles with. Um, there might be some that he's successful with, right? So then again, oh, Kate, you're, are you muted? You're muted. I was making a silly comment. So, no. <laughs> so then again, we'd go through that process of really thinking about what are we going to do? What are we going to say to elicit that behavior? And then how we would respond if Jack does follow that routine and then if he doesn't so that we can provide that instruction to help him get to that skill. And then again, yeah about all the opportunities we're providing. Yeah, Judy, we want to build what's called behavioral momentum. We want to get it going. I don't know if any of you ever tried to, like you've decided I'm going to be a runner and you're <laughs> going to like just go out and like, I'm going to go crush three miles today. And then it doesn't happen. And you're not feeling really excited about trying again the next day when like your hamstrings are so tight, you can't walk. So it's like, we want to get that behavioral momentum going so it's, it's about making sure exactly that allows that success to snowball. You want them to feel successful. So you're going to find activities. You're going to find opportunities. Like I was loving someone else was talking about, you know, you have, you, you prompt Maya to share and you say, oh, now you can have a turn with this. So that turn taking, get that, that momentum going if it doesn't feel so horrible to give up and then you've got empty hands. So thinking about those things to really get it going so they can feel what the successful, successful learning feels like. Absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out, Judy. So I know we didn't have a ton of time to do all the practice, but an hour goes by really fast when you're having fun. So to sum up, an ELO is a specialized strategy that's used to plan for, arrange, and deliver individualized planned instruction. And the goal of an ELO is for children to learn and achieve their individual learning objectives. And like Kate has mentioned throughout this, participate with greater independence in their classrooms. And we know that the success of an ELO with any particular child and on any particular goal is really measured by that child's progress. And there's lots of advantages to an ELO, right? We're taking advantage of our existing routines and authentic activities. We're not doing planning some extra time to do this. We're really um, focusing on things that kids like, right? We're thinking about what's motivating for them and interesting. We're highlighting those functional skills like Kate talked about. And if we're doing this across the day, across routines and activities, then we're enhancing their ability to generalize that skill throughout multiple um, situations and experiences. What questions do you have for us? I can't believe that next week is the last week already. Um, we'll talk about that top block, which is child and fo child focused instructional strategies and other mouthful. And I'm sure you all have realized this, that sometimes kiddos are going to require an even higher level of support than an ELO. So that'll be more directed and explicit instruction in order to achieve that learning objective and take advantage of the typical ch early childhood curriculum. 
So those child-focused instructional strategies require um, more systematic instruction. They're more frequent and they're even more carefully planned than an ELO. Oh, good question, Sherry. So these are all being uploaded onto Skippy's YouTube page, which you can find by visiting our website, which is scpartnershipsforinclusion.org. And you can just click on the button up here for the YouTube channel, and then it will have all of these sessions. It won't have this one just quite yet, but this one will be up there tomorrow. So I'm gonna launch a quick poll. And if you wouldn't mind giving us feedback, we appreciate it. And if you do have anything else that you wanted to share, you can feel free to email us here. Um, just let us know any other questions that you might have. <clears throat> yeah, I wanna thank you all. Unfortunately, um, due to some uh, personal family issues, I won't be able to attend next week. Um, so I'm sorry that I'll miss the last one together, but I hope you all have a wonderful time. I so appreciate your engagement and your participation and your willingness to be here on a Monday afternoon, the <laughs> end of the day. Um, so thank you all. And uh, yeah, don't be a stranger. Send us some emails and thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. We do appreciate your time and let us know what do you want to see next? Right. We'll have that last session, our deep dive on child focused instructional strategies, and we'll definitely miss Kate, but I'll try to make it as engaging as I can without Kate <laughs> and her fun. <laughs> it's going to be hard. Oh, it'll be great. It'll be it. great. It'll be much a little more streamlined. <laughs> and remember, you can find the recordings here. And once the once we have all four sessions, um, I've created a playlist so that all four of them will be in one place for you to review or share with uh, colleagues and staff and friends.